Edward Hanna. Uh, and it'll be uh, uh, 45 minutes. So um, it's on North Atlantic climate variability and seasonal prediction. So um, Edward. Thanks very much. So I'm also going to touch on North Atlantic climate variability. So, so it'll be partly across schematic talk with one of the other um, sessions as well. Um, so, okay, so what I'm going to cover is the uh, following. Okay, so, um, yeah, so a lot of my work's focused on the green and ice sheet, so crossing over between, between glaciology and um, climatology, I've done work on the green and ice mass balance, which made me interested in uh, blocking higher pressure over Greenland and then links to the North Atlantic jet stream. Um, but more recently, I've also been uh, doing work with um, uh, various people on um, predictability of, of the um, jet as well. Um, so I should just acknowledge, if I just go, go back, uh, Richard Hall, who's post postdoctoral research um, assistant at, um, at Lincoln, uh, and then uh, Dr. Pauline uh, Wai, who's in control systems engineer um, in uh, Sheffield, um, who's been helping with some aspects of the um, jet stream modeling that I'm going to be talking about a, a, a bit later. Um, so the topics I'm going to be covering are um, green and blocking and uh, links with North Atlantic jet, focusing on summer. Summer's a particularly interesting season because it seems that we haven't um, collectively quite nailed the predictability there yet compared with winter. Uh, but I'm also going to talk about um, NEO and jet changes in um, winter as well. Um, links with UK extreme weather um, in the last um, 12 years or so. Um, and then I'm going to go on to talk about the um, uh, seasonal forecasting work using a uh, complex systems modeling. Um, basically, it's a um, statistical approach which complements dynamical um, jet modeling. And then briefly mention the relevance of that modeling to uh, future uh, climate prediction. Um, so, um, just as a tiny bit of background, um, obviously one of the main signals of global warming in recent years has been amplified uh, polar warming, particularly in the Arctic region, which um, I'm sure you've seen many different versions of this, uh, uh, I guess, um, surface temperature data set, but um, it's, um, it's, it's quite different um, in terms of stronger warming being in winter compared with summer, but um, having said that, regions like Greenland um, have, have warmed very significantly in summer in the last um, uh, 20 to 30 years as well. So something between uh, two degrees and, and, and five degrees warming over Greenland, for example, between the early to mid 1990s. And of course, that Arctic amplification, if you look at this uh, cross section through the, the atmosphere, this is for um, um, the northern hemisphere, um, late winter, and this is for the northern hemisphere summer. Um, this Arctic amplification is mainly, but not entirely, a near surface feature. You can see it in the uh, temperature anomalies, um, temperature response here. Um, so that's uh, actually that's for the end, late 21st century uh, minus the uh, recent period. Uh, but in the tropical regions, this scale here is with latitude. You can also see um, extra convective activity giving you upper tropospheric warming. So these are very well known signals, except that, of course, um, the, the, um, it's pretty inconsistent between. Um, model responses and there's, there's people here who, who do that work directly and some of you know a lot more about this than, than I do. But basically we've got competing influences on uh, mid-latitude jet stream over the North Atlantic and other regions. But now those influences vary by season. So when we're talking about the um, uh, systems modeling a bit later, um, these are just two of the factors that, that, that we need to, to consider or, or what's happening in the tropics as well as uh, with the poles. But also how that varies by season because obviously in the summer, um, season, the Arctic amplification is considerably less than in the winter, so you haven't now got the same surface warming signature. This is obviously a model response, so it's not, not quite necessarily replicating exactly what's going to happen in the century, of course. Uh, but the best estimate, if you like, or, or one estimate, this is um, from Barnes and Swing, a recent review paper, is that um, Arctic amplification continues to be uh, relatively muted um, in summer compared with winter, and therefore, um, the sort of the one, one factor which is uh, potentially pushing the jet stream further south over the North Atlantic and weakening that um, may not then be so um, strong as in, um, in winter. However, um, sea ice losses are very pronounced in, and continue to be very pronounced in late summer in the, um, in the Arctic. So I would argue that actually Arctic amplification in, in particular parts of the Arctic is, is quite strong in, in, in summer as well, um, although it's still less than in winter. So um, this is just from the Arctic report card, which is an annual update. Many of you will have seen it of um, Arctic environmental changes and the red lines, just the um, uh, late summer um, sea ice extent. And of course, there's feedbacks between what's happening in the ocean surrounding Greenland and the mass balance of the ice sheet itself. And several recent studies have well illustrated that. 
Um, and of course, we've we've had recent events such as well. This is actually now seven years ago, but the um, record surface melt from satellite data in uh, July 2012 over uh, most of the surface of of the ice sheets. Um, and, and actually, this season we we were near record levels of melt for the time of year a few weeks ago. Um, so 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 we will be very likely, in, in my view, to see more of these sort of episodes within the next um, um, decade based on the recent warming trends in, in Greenland. Um, but, but if you look at the uh, geopotential heights above the Greenland region, so the map which is shown on, on the left there, that, that's the black um, polygon area surrounding um, Greenland, so this, this region here, um, you can see a, a, a big red blob which is uh, basically um, high height anomalies so over Greenland for, for this recent period, um, summer uh, 2007 to 2018, uh, minus a climatological baseline, which is 1971 to uh, 2000. Um, so if you take a time series of the geopotential heights over that, that box region, uh, based on uh, reanalysis data, and then you, you also um, uh, do some corrections of the data as, as well, um, then you end up with this red time series here. So this has been published in, um, several different papers and, and shows uh, a record level of blocking in summer over Greenland in the um, last few decades. Now, John Robson um, here and various others and, and Tim Williams have also independently published um, analysis um, indicating um, unusually high heights over the Greenland region in, um, in summer. So, so this has been shown by, by a number of um, recent studies. Um, so, um, so what, what, what you can also see over the UK region, it's not quite so strong, but also stretching out into the Western Atlantic, is relatively low geopotential bias in summer, uh, which is um, probably some, some kind of jet response, um, albeit this is over quite a short time period. So we're not sure um, entirely the, the um, extent of natural vari variability versus force signal there, and obviously it needs um, a lot further studies, but certainly from the um, observational record from reanalysis, those are high, unusually high levels of um, blocking over Greenland in the last um, uh, decades, 10 to 15 years. So if you then, um, we also published this a few months ago, if you, if you look at the um, uh, high cost and forecast for the CMX files, and we're shortly going to replicate this for CMX6, um, and, and you look at the individual models, uh, then you get the um, gray lines for, for their rendition of Greenland blocking during the period shown on the graph, which is 1960 through the rest of this century. Um, you compare that with the reanalysis record, there's several, several different versions of the reanalysis record, depending on whether you base it on uh, the European non reanalysis or the um, uh, US one. Uh, but, but, but basically, um, this increase in Greenland blocking in the summer in the last couple of decades does not seem to be picked up by, by any of the CMIP models in CMIP 5. I don't know what CMIP 6 will show, um, so we'll repeat that experiment, so that'll be quite interesting. Uh, so, um, in other words, there, there seems to be a bit of a challenge with the models in picking up this, um, this record increase in, in Greenland blocking. Of course, at the regional scale, um, it's much more challenging for, for the models to replicate some of these, these features of high latitude blocking and so on. And blocking, um, this recent review by Tim Willings in current climate change reports uh, is um, uh, uh, quite a challenge. So um, the mo there, there are progress being made with the models. And again, people um, here much more experienced with, with, with those directly working. Um, but um, certainly that, that observed signal um, doesn't seem to be picked up for, for the last um, couple of decades or so. Um, now, um, there's a corresponding um, shift in, in the jet over the North Atlantic region, so bird's eye view of the North Pole. So if you look at the, um, uh, what, the 700, these are 700 Pascal uh, heights, North Atlantic obviously near the top of these charts. This is um, average summer, so June, July, August again, for 2007 to 2018. So this is the big Arctic sea ice loss period, 2007, you know, an unusually low year at the time, a record year of Arctic loss that was then transcended by 2012 and, 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 and the sea ice um, uh, continues to, to, to rest with something like 13% per decade loss in late summer, isn't it, over the last few decades. Um, but if you compare the, um, jet, the jet stream um, lines uh, for those recent um, 12 summers with the climatological baseline, gain 19 to 2000, you can see the North Atlantic sector um, then, then you can see there's a much uh, wavier jet pattern, uh, which, which is responding basically to the increase in, uh, in Greenland blocking 
uh, that I've shown on the um, previous slide. So what happens is that um, um, the, the green blocking appears to push, push the North Atlantic jet further south, several degrees of North Atlantic, and also can weaken it as well. I've also done published daily case studies of um, what's happening at the synoptic time scale. Others have done work on, on um, that as well. Um, so, um, uh, although it's quite a short time period, there has been a tendency for a um, uh, further southward um, jet that has not just been forced necessarily by the screen blocking. Of course, people have done work on um, Atlantic SSTs and so on, um, and aerosols, various other things um, causing the jet changes. Um, and there is a question about natural variability, of course, versus force signal. Uh, but the key point is that areas in Northwest Europe, of course, the, the UK is, is, is a prime example, uh, are very sensitive to even slight changes in, in the jet, um, give you quite dramatic changes in extreme weather conditions. And of course, it's fairly well established, it's the um, NAO and jet changes in the UK in summer. If you have more negative NAO, then uh, we can end up with some of these record uh, wet summer uh, weather conditions because the jets further south over England and Wales. Uh, although Northwest Scotland um, uh, can have the opposite effect of, of being unusually dry in those, those conditions as well. So this is fairly well known, so I'll just skip over that. So, so with increased screen and blocking, um, there's a tendency on average, obviously not all the time, to, to have a greater likelihood of um, wetter summer weather conditions over the UK. And in fact, in the last decade, obviously, we've had 2007, 2012. Last month, we had June 2018, um, uh, near record levels of rainfall across big, uh, large spots of, of central England and wind sheet floods in uh, Lincolnshire, for example. Um, of course, um, last year was, was record warm and, and dry for much of the summer, so that was a, a contrast. So, of course, this is just one effect on the um, on the jet stream. But I, I do believe the green and block has had a significant effect um, linking with those wet, wet weather, summer weather conditions um, at times in the last um, 10 to 15 um, summers over the... Um, UK. So, so 2007, uh, major floods over large parts of, of England and Wales. Many of you will uh, uh, have been affected or remember those, particularly Hull and Sheffield. Uh, Sheffield, where I was living and working at the time, this is one of the main downtown Sheffield. Um, there are actually a couple of people killed in, in um, uh, Sheffield as a result of these floods. Um, and then 2012, almost a repeat performance um, across um, uh, much of England, Wales, well, southern and eastern Scotland. Uh, but no, because the jet's further south, um, you've actually got brown patches in northwest Scotland. So that's probably the uh, more reliable place to, to go in the UK for, for summer holidays these, these days um, with the green and blocking influence. And then last month, um, Wayne Fleet in Lincolnshire, not too far from where I live, uh, we, we, we've had the second highest blocked. Um, uh, you can see the higher geopotential um, heights on this over, over the Greenland region. Um, and we, we, again, we've got Something like more than that will be long term average due rain to where the large parts of central England will uh, uh, result in um, impacts, extreme weather events, flooding um, there as well. Um, of course, last year was a some, uh, complete contrast, and there's many effects on, on the jet stream, um, and others are going to talk about heat waves um, later in, in this session. But also note with, with winters, obviously, with increased screen and blocking, uh, then you've got more negative than any other, so on average, you tend to get. Um, colder at times winter weather conditions over the UK, um, except that the, obviously note that we haven't had this green and blocking increase in winter um, like we have in summer. Um, nevertheless, um, something else that um, I found from, from work which was done in the Met Office and, and with crew researchers as well, um, was that um, there have been um, significantly enha enhanced extreme uh, weather conditions over the UK as a result of increased um, interannual fluctuations in the NAO. Um, particularly during early winter, but also during winter as a whole, which is actually statistically significant and is a long-term trend over the last century. I'll show um, the um, um, I'll show the NEO fluctuations in a moment. So events such as um, uh, again, I'm slight, slightly cherry picking, but ex examples such as the beast from the East Severe Snow event in uh, uh, much of the eastern part of the country, certainly just over a year ago, my home weather station here. Um, and then also uh, Sheffield, for example, again, gridlocked by snow, the main roads all blocked, country, large parts ran out of salt in December 2010, which was the coldest December since 1890 in Central England temperature record. So that's Glossop Road in Sheffield, for anyone who knows Sheffield, uh, was followed that, that December, just five years later, December 2015, which was the mildest December ever in the um, same um, uh, England temperature record, very wet and stormy. And of course, we had winters 2013-14 uh, just before then, and winters 2015-16, major problems with flooding. You can see the rainfall anomalies here. Um, York, um, this isn't obviously um, completely unknown for York. The, the ooze does regularly, fairly regularly flood, but this was a symptom of the high rainfalls 
in December 2015. And again, very uh, an unusually positive NEO. On the other hand, um, just a few months ago, we had the highest ever um, UK winter um, temperature, obviously superimposed on, on all this variability. There's, there's global warming, of course, uh, but 21.2 degrees at Kew Gardens. Um, and I, I've mentioned the other mild wet stormy winters also within the last um, decade or so. So um, this is a graph showing, um, this is uh, basically a smooth um, graph of um, the principal component, the Hurrell based NEO time series since 1899, updated to last December. Um, so you can see the variability is some more, it's actually something like doubled in the last um, uh, century. Much of the increase in variability has been in the last uh, few decades, last uh, three or four decades or so. And that is actually statistically significant. i um, done work on that with Phil Jones, with Adam Skyth and so on, published a, a few years ago, but the series is updated here. Um, and, and of course, it's, it's bound to be linked with, with some of these increase in, in extreme winter weather that I've, I've mentioned. Um, so um, actually just compositing there some of the um, uh, extreme um, UK instrumental Mac records that we've had in summer and winter. Um, so here we've got the years on the left for temperature in the top table and England and Wales precipitation in the lower table, central England temperature in the top table. Um, you've got June, July, August, uh, summer average um, temperature anomalies, average rainfall anomalies, uh, winter average temperature anomalies, average rainfall anomalies, and then for the month of December. Um, so, um, and I've circled um, in the top table, we, we had the, the coldest uh, central England temperature since 1890. Uh, the warmest central England temperature um, uh, in December this is um, ever, uh, within five years of each other in 2010 and 2015. Uh, in the summer rainfall record, we've had these two record wet summers uh, that are the wettest for, for a century or so, at least in, 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 that, um, in that record. Um, and then, of course, we, 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 we've just had the record wet June as well. It's quite interesting that actually we've only got one, uh, well, 2013 perhaps, but one other summer in the last um, 12 years of significantly below average precipitation um, for England and Wales as a whole. Um, so a tendency has been for, for wetter and cooler or near normal summers rather than extremely hot summers in the last 12 years. Quite a short time period though, but um, green and blocking has definitely been, been unusually high and that's bound to have at times of, um, an influence pushing the jet south and, and then obviously affecting conditions at times over um, England and Wales to give some of these uh, uh, so some part of this summer response. So, um, so what I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work um, that, that uh, my team has been involved in terms of modelling um, using the statistical approach, um, jet stream fluctuations over North Atlantic. So this is just a, a very simple diagram, just showing some of the factors that um, obviously that you're most of you um, well aware um, um, that, that can cause the jet stream to either strengthen or, or weaken. Uh, but there's various ways that, you, that we can measure the jet stream. So NEO is just one of those. We also look at um, uh, PC2 and PC3 as well. So East Atlantic and Scandinavian um, mean sea level pressures or geopotential height uh, patterns over the North Atlantic. We also look at um, jet speed and jet latitude using the Willings 2010. Um, it's uh, mean you, you, you wind speed over, the, over, the, over a sector of the zonal section of the North Atlantic. Um, so there's five or six different um, indices that we, we use. And I should say that although we've published a few papers for, from this work, um, it's still quite early, early stage. So um, some of the, the results, although all, all of this is, is published, are quite, um, there's a lot of follow-up work that we can do. So what we had already published, um, I think, a, a couple of years ago now, um, is um, uh, this is the observed NAO um, for, for the last um, 30 years or so, the black line here. And then using simple multivariate regression um, to build up a, a jet stream model using various uh, uh, predictors of uh, tropical and, and polar and mid latitude predictors, so sea, sea temperature patterns in the North Atlantic, um, sea ice in different sectors of the Arctic, um, uh, sea, sea temperature in um, various tropical zones, and then um, we can get a, a fairly good fit um, using this training and testing periods um, uh, to, to the observed NEO, which is, um, well, the, the, so, so, so our statistical model is in blue and the gloss C5 is in, um, in, is, is in red there. So, so that was work done with Adam Skyf and we published it in a, in a few papers in the last um, couple of year, years or so. Um, but that is just using a simple multivariate um, statistical approach. We thought we could try and do better than that. So we then uh, teamed up with some control system engineers uh, at Sheffield to actually uh, use a, another method, which I'm going to talk about in a, um, 
in a moment. Um, but you can see some of the factors, key factors, which are mentioned there. So uh, thinking things like um, Berenc Kara Sea Ice, which is just north of the um, Russian Arctic, just east of Scandinavia, um, El Nino, um, and, and, and so on. But those are some of the key factors that, that seem to be important in that statistical mod model from the work that Richard um, Hall led on um, that, uh, uh, that is shown, shown here. So, so that seems to, other people have done these sort of uh, statistical models. Uh, but but we're, we're getting correlations, something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 out of the um, modeling um, for um, those retrospective time periods. Uh, so, um, but then then obviously we want to develop that further. What I should say is that it's not just a case of um, forecasting the NAO, because actually the relation between NAO and weather conditions over different parts of the UK is obviously quite variable spatially. Um, so if you, if you look at temperature, um, for winter, the winter NEO versus temperature, positive correlation over most of the country. So that's simple. So if you predict a positive NEO, it's milder over, over most of the country in winter or all of the country. Uh, whereas precipitation is much more complex. So positive NEO, you've got blue colours in, in the northwestern parts of the of the countries there, um, but red colours in, in the southeast. So opposite correlations on the eastern and uh, western side. There's a bit of a seesaw effect there. Uh, and again, it depends what measure of, 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 um, of the jet stream you take. If you look at jet, jet speed, then uh, um, you've got a different relation again. Um, so um, there's some, some quite subtle differences. So, so that's why it's worth using all these different, and we do uh, different measures of the, um, of the jet stream. Um, and also, um, partly as a result of other modes of atmospheric variability, um, when you have similar NAO values in, in different years, so these are winter uh, rainfall, um, then you can get quite different spatial patterns of rainfall across the UK, depending on what things like the East Atlantic and Scandinavian pattern do. So this is for winter 2013, 14, winter 15, winter 2016. They all have quite um, similar positive values of the NAO, um, but because um, the East Atlantic pattern, for example, was relatively positive in this winter, then, then the rainfall numbers are spaced a bit more towards the, the south of England. So, so, so that's why it's um, really important to be able to predict not just the NEO, but other jet stream measures such as the East Atlantic pattern, for example, um, it, if, you're, if we're going to be able to predict uh, rainfall anomalies at the um, local to regional level over, over, over the UK. So, so this is just showing the first three OF, uh, EOFs of uh, MSLP variability over the North Atlantic region, so any of the top East Atlantic pattern, Scandinavian pattern. And then um, here uh, we've got uh, December, January, February winter sea level pressure for 2013 14 uh, winter, uh, which actually shows something of an East Atlantic type pattern as well as a uh, modestly positive NEO. So that's why um, with the East Atlantic pattern, you tend to get um, with positive East Atlantic pattern. Um, much greater rainfall numbers in the southeastern parts of the country compared with if you if you have a purely positive NEO, which is the top diagram um, in the centre, which is where your blue colours are displaced more to the northwestern parts of the um, of the UK. So winter 2013-14, which is when the Thames flooded um, and, and the major floods were uh, extreme rainfall numbers were in the south of the country, was a positive NEO winter, but it was also a positive East Atlantic uh, winter. So we're really getting the regional response here. So we need to be able to predict all these modes of um, jet variability. Um, so winter 2013-14 in the red circle here, um, this is um, um, something that dynamical models predict a neutral, near neutral NAO. Um, so here we've got um, uh, the um, uh, glossy, glossy form, I think it is. So this is from Adam's paper with, with an updated data set from, from, from Adam. So uh, the, the, the observational, the real NEO, if you like, is in black. And then we've got the gloss C5 ensemble mean and ensemble members are in um, uh, orange for the retrospective um, and then uh, blue for the real time forecast. So near neutral NEO was predicted for uh, winter 2013-14, but um, a moderately positive NEO observed. Uh, but of course, um, um, what we need to do is, is, is actually, uh, and the Met Office people can comment on, 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 on this perhaps, but, but, but is um, predict the East Atlantic pattern to be able to, to get the level of um, uh, what, what we've seen on the previous slide. To get the regionality of the rainfall response, we need to be able to predict all these different components of, of the jet changes. Um, so uh, so um, that's, that's an example of where there was a modest departure of the uh, dynamical model prediction from the 
ob observed um, jet stream fluctuations, but 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 that can potentially have a, a, a major impact on on the um, on 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 how um, how how good the predictions turn out to, to be at, at the regional to, to local level. So um, yeah, sorry, and th this is a, a, a similar diagram to what I've shown a few a few slides ago. So this is showing the regionality of relationships uh, between um, uh, different measures of um, jet stream changes over the North Atlantic and UK temperature on the right. So this is the summer NEO correlated with June, July, August temperature. So um, positive NEO, we've got a uh, uh, positive temperature. That makes sense um, because negative NEOs in summer tend to be linked with cooler weather, summer weather conditions over the UK. And then here we have two different measures of um, the uh, jet stream, which are jet latitude and jet speed, just following Tim Williams' method. And then there's correlation between those two measures of the jet stream and summer rainfall over the, over the UK. And so uh, uh, what you notice is there's, there's a big difference between northwest Scotland and much of the rest of the UK, as, as shown through some of the anomaly um, uh, maps of, of the recent wet summers that I've um, I've shown you earlier. Um, so um, uh, and and from some of the work that we've done on the multivariate regression modelling uh, published a couple of years ago, um, again for Adam, uh, is that. Um, uh, we, we found there's different um, uh, predictors um, that, that in the statistical models that um, um, uh, seem to come out of, uh, well, for jet speed, it seems to be Atlantic and tropical sea so SST anomalies seem to be important, whereas for jet latitude, it's more Arctic sea ice and, and, and things like solar vari variability, which is perhaps a surprising one there. Uh, but those came out of those relatively simple models. Um, very recently, we just published in QJ Royal Metsoc, um complex systems mod, uh, modeling based um, enhancement, if you like, um, of, of, the, um, of, of the previous work that I've shown you. So this is using a tool called NARMAX, which was developed, patented by control system engineers at Sheffield, uh, which has been applied in many different fields, but hardly at all in meteorology or climatology um, so far. Uh, so um, basically it's a form of machine learning, but it's um, um, relatively transparent compared with something like neural networks. So in other words, it, it does allow you to, to drill into the um, model and actually try and tease out physically what, what, what's going on, uh, or at least do some sort of interpretation of, of the different uh, predictors from the, um, from the model. Uh, so the mathematical form um, is, is shown there. Um, now, the, it's a non, it, it takes into account nonlinear effects in the system as well as linear effects. Uh, but it will try fitting linear models first. If those don't work, it will then go to, to, to fitting nonlinear models. But importantly, it's got um, um, aspects to um, stop overfitting uh, the model, um, which obviously could, could give you artificially high um, correlations between observed jet fluctuations and, uh, and, and, and modeled ones. Um, so um, it, it is based on a, on a robust procedure. There's books that have been published on this. So it's, uh, Steve Billings um, invented, uh, developed the method in, in Sheffield and wrote a book on this published in 2013. And it's been used in many different fields, but just not, not so far meteorology and climatology. Um, so, so I do get the impression that statistical models have been a bit neglected in, in this field in favor of um, that, you know, the huge developments that have been made with dynamical modeling, in, in, um, understandably so in the last uh, um, decade or, or, or two, but perhaps it's time to, to come back to the, to see what value added we can actually um, get out of the um, uh, uh, more complex statistical models now. So um, very similar to what we've done with the multivariate regression models. Richard Hall, again, has led on, on a lot of this work, but um, basically um, there's various terms which are based on literature and on observed data sets. So, so things like um, sea surface temperatures, um, the, tri the, the AMO the, or AMV, the North Atlantic Tripole and Horseshoe, uh, Greenland, Iceland and uh, Norwegian seas, average sea surface temperatures, uh, which are also linked with sea ice changes in the um, subarctic. Uh, meridional um, sea temperature changes over North Atlantic um, and sea level pressure over the Barents Sea region, which is um, also linked with sea ice changes in, in that region. Um, El Nino, so N3.4 um, in the tropical regions, uh, MJO, uh, tropical precipitation, which is a surrogate for potential Rosby wave propagation effects in the mid uh, latitude jet stream. Um, um, so um, um, all those terms go in, as well as various cryospheric, um, stratospheric factors, QBO. Um, so snow cover, regional sea ice concentration, and then things like solar, solar um, factors or solar energy changes, which um, um, can affect um, conditions in the stratosphere and potentially couple down to the troposphere. Um, but obviously that's uh, more in the winter. 
And then also some sort of background climate variability, atmospheric um, CO2, northern hemisphere, temperature trend. Um, so we've only really applied this NARMAX um, complex systems modeling um, for winter so far. We haven't yet done it for summer, but it does show um, considerable potential for other seasons as well. Um, we have applied it um, a little bit to, to looking at the East Atlantic pattern as well as the NEO pattern. I'll show you a result in a moment. Um, so for winter forecasting, um, terms are generally available um, uh, for driving the North Atlantic winter jet stream uh, a few months in advance from May to November. Um, we're actually doing parallel forecasts for different forms of the NAO. Um, so there's a simple uh, south minus north, there's always minus ice in the NAO index, but there's also a principal component based Hurrell type um, NAO as well, um, which is um, that's the simple C, that, that's, that's the CPC data set. Um, now, likewise, we, we, as with the um, uh, multivariate regression modeling, we have um, training and testing periods. We, we've tried the, the, this with different testing, sorry, different training periods. Um, so 1956 to 2010, that's governed by availability of um, driving data sets or, or predictance, if you like, uh, from reanalysis data and other observational based data sets. Uh, but also a more recent um, training period, 1980 to 2010, which is based on, on even greater availability of, of satellite data, data sets, for example, for tropical precipitation, for example. Um, so, and, and then we've, we've used the last eight years for the testing data set. Um, there's linear and non-linear or polynomial NARMAX models, and um, we, we, again, we've um, got results from, from, from both of those. Uh, so, um, this is an example. This is, I think, this is from the, pay, the QJ paper that's just come out. Um, so the observed, um, this is the station-based NEO, um, is shown in black. And then we've got linear and polynomial NARMAX models with uh, training and testing periods, which are shown by the solid and dashed lines, respectively, are shown in um, uh, for the linear model in um, uh, orange and the uh, polynomial non-linear model in blue. So um, um, correlation is typically about 0.8, but there's different ways that we can assess these forecasts, MAE and RMSE and so on. Um, so these are some of the terms that go into, these are the terms that go into these models. Um, uh, and um, if, if, if you want to look at our dynamical interpretation of that, then please read the QJ paper that's just appeared on, online recently. Uh, but um, those are the, basically a combination of tropical and um, high latitude terms and, and things also like sea, sea surface, surface temperature patterns in the North Atlantic as well as cryospheric uh, terms in some of the Arctic uh, sub-regions as well. Um, and this is, a, this is actually shown an example for the East Atlantic pattern where again we've got the training in solid blue and testing period in, in, in dotted blue uh, lines. Uh, the actual observed East Atlantic pattern, pattern is shown in the black line and then the uh, NARMAX model is with the uh, uh, blue line here, and that shows um, something like 0.8 to um, greater um, fit to the um, observed data. So, um, yeah, so, 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 so we've only published one, one paper on the NARMAT, the QJ paper that's just come out, but there's a lot more work that could be done if we get the chance to do it. So um, we need to extend um, this early work to looking at other jet metrics. So we've done a bit of work on the semantic present, but look, we need to look at um, other EOFs of jet variability, other way, you know, things like jet latitude, jet, jet speed, and also things like persistence and extreme events that could potentially be predicted as well. Um, so, and, and we can also produce prob probabilistic predictions because there's a, a recent development of the NARMAX by the control system engineers called a cloud NARMAX, which is a bit like the um, ensemble approach in NWP, uh, where, where we can actually use the, the NARMAX to actually produce a, uh, from a, 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 if you like, a cloud of models to actually uh, give probabilistic likelihoods of, of particular NEO uh, values or within a, a, a certain range. Um, but we can also look at things like non-stationarity because there's also a moving average form of the NARMAX as well. Um, we, we can um, alter things like the forecast lead time um, as well. Um, so, um, and then this slide, um, obviously I won't have time to describe all the fine details, but basically if we, th these are different NARMAX models, each of the surface here. So for instance, this is that, uh, the, using the, uh, Polynomial, this is the nonlinear NARMAX model using the um, uh, simple NEO index of south minus north, as well as minus ice, with a training data set from 1980 to 2010 and a testing data set from 2011 to 2018 for the purple circle. Uh, and the blue and the 
um, green circles and yellow circles are um, other forms of the NARMAX model, but all, all with training, all with uh, training uh, data sets from 1980 to 2010. So there's a uh, Hurrell PPC NEO um, predicted version of the model, so that's the top right one, and then a uh, uh, linear version of the um, uh, of, of the simple NEO index, which is the top left model there. Um, so what, 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 what you can see in the boxes there are various um, uh, aspects, um, things like uh, some of the oceanic, atmospheric and cryospheric terms, stratospheric terms, um, um, I'm not sure of any stratospheric terms there, but uh, terms that, that, that are used in the model to predict the state of, of NEO in the subsequent few months. So where the circles overlap, this is where the models have been constructed independently and, and, and you can see that those, those are coming out of all models. Things like Ferenc C sea level pressure, uh, which is um, north of the Russian region, um, uh, sorry, Ferenc Kara sea, 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 sea level pressure in the green box in the centre there. Um, and then we've got Bering Strait sea ice cover in that region of the Arctic, which is um, towards the North American side of the, the Arctic. Um, but we think, again, uh, please do read the QJ paper if you're interested. There, there's interaction terms between things like El Nino and MGO and some of these um, subarctic um, uh, terms um, that basically um, uh, we think there's some teleconnections and, and interactions between these remote um, forcings um, that can affect the state of the, of the NEO. Uh, but there is a potential to apply this to decadal as well as seasonal forecasting. As, as I say, um, there's a lot more work that we can do and also to test um, uh, things like CMIP6 model runs to try and help identify the better performing uh, models. Um, so for example, study by Bavini and Tregnazzo identified that some GCM uh, from CMIP5, they, they, they reproduced a non-physical NAO, for example, because they didn't pro properly represent green and blocking, which I mentioned before. Um, so we, we can help tease out some of those um, ensembles of models using um, uh, NARMAX. So in summary, um, uh, recent observational evidence um, links, um, uh, albeit quite short term fluctuations in the North Atlantic jet stream with increased blocking over, over Greenland. So, uh, which is on average uh, weakened the jet, jet stream, pushed it further south. Um, sorry, it's actually um, uh, may have strengthened the jet stream, pushed it further south, and, and, and affected um, extreme rainfall anomalies uh, at times in summer over England and Wales. Um, and as Greenland gets warmer as part of Arctic amplification, there's no sign that this, this um, change is, 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 is going away. Although, as I say, it's only a short run of, of years to, to, to assess such a change. Um, on the other hand, in winter, the jet stream has become significantly more variable, as you can see through the um, NEO changes that I mentioned earlier, particularly in early winter. Uh, we're not quite sure why that is, but we think we can use the NARMAX models to tease out some of the processes there. Uh, but it'd be great to do some dynamical model studies coupled with that as well. Um, and um, there's some issues with the CMIP-5 models in, in replicating high latitude blocking. Uh, and then NARMAX complex systems modeling um, shows significant potential. Um, and other forms of machine learning, I, I think there's going to be talk that follows to, to actually um, try and help um, interpret results from dynamical models as well as potentially add value to um, the dynamical uh, model output. So that's, that's it. So thanks very much. Very informative talk. Do you have any questions? I was wondering if there's a classic example of forecasting as part of the CIS prediction network, but mm. forecasting to that extent that you, you know, tested your approach against this wide range of forecasters, if your skill could maybe compete with the, the other skills. Yes, it would be interesting. I mean, it's um, it's also. It's, because it's a completely different tool, obviously, from dynamical modeling, it's also um, attacking the problem from a, another point of view, and it's, it's adding interpretation potentially to dynamical model results. So, um, because it's, it's relatively transparent compared with many other statistical modeling methods um, in terms of um, looking at uh, predictions and predictors that go into the NARMAX modeling. Thanks. So, obviously, the, the key test of any forecasting systems predicting the future rather than the past. So can I encourage you to publish all the NARMAX predictions ahead of the future? Can you do that so you can see what's really working 
Yes, I think one of the issues that we, we, we've got, and we've got sort of this thing, well, we need data to monitor them, they're going to be at the moment. So I don't know to what extent the similar loop dynamic models that. Um, uh, so we can't really produce a forecast until it's definitely in November, but for some of these we can need some data, so we'll certainly let you know. So I don't know how it is the costing part of the other uh, quarterly planning for the model. But we, we, we think we can actually push back with the results in the same time. Yeah, just as a bit of a to be you know, yes. ahead of the actual event. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. As I, as I say, this is relatively early stage work, and you'll know, see some time. Um, uh, it would be great to be stressed. Okay, one more question. I'll just leave it there. Um, just, maybe just a clarification. When you say you have a printability from the CIS laws and the changes to the current CIS, you're talking about the barracks and currency laws. Is that correct? You are not considering yes. other side like overseas. No, no we, we are considering um, other um, regions as well. So, um, in fact, um, Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure if it's on because I, I. Oh, sorry, I, do you want me to get the slides back? Up? Yeah, don't, don't, don't worry because we, I don't want to interrupt. Yeah, so, so we are looking at a bit like the truffle sea, sea surface and the truffle rainfall. We're, we're looking at a number of, of uh, sub regions within the Arctic region. It's just the ones that came out of this. It's most of it, but it's not significant, really, uh, very common to see. Uh, but uh, it depends on the model. Sometimes we do get other regions in the as well. So we look all around the Arctic, not just that region. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, our next